Superb guys, I hope you guys had a great day till now and uh, I know we are running a little late but uh, say la vie, such is life but uh, you should be super excited about this uh, super duper panel which uh, we have today. I am quite excited so let's start. I think uh, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome uh, you today to this highly anticipated panel on the topic that stands at the forefront of a rapidly evolving digital landscape. Gen Z the decoding the digital generation. Now, I don't know whether it's Gen Z or Gen Z, probably I'll learn over the course of this panel how to sort of pronounce it correct. And to be honest, in an era defined by digital transformation, we find ourselves at a pivotal crossroads where Gen Z audiences exert an increasingly significant influence on our strategies, our choices and the very fabric of our brands. We are obviously honored today to be joined by not one but five CMOs from India's top leading brands Individuals who hold the reins of what our audiences will consume tomorrow. Through our discussions, we aim to uncover uh, the intricacies of Gen Z and their values, their aspirations, their dance with technology. Well written, whoever has written this. Um, and we delve into the, uh, you know, the insights of forging meaningful collections with Gen Z. So, without wasting any further time, as the topic suggests, the world has clearly undergone a drastic change in the last few years, right? We'll all be in a session which will always have discussions which are pre-COVID and post-COVID. How does this topic have relevance when it comes to your particular brand? And we can start in the order that you guys are sitting. So Sundar, starting with you, when you talk about Gen Z and decoding that audience, what relevance does this topic have when it comes to your brand? Sure. So, I mean, I think what has happened over the last few years, pandemic and post, uh, I think it's changed for both the cohorts, millennials and Gen Z, in probably different ways, right? Uh, I think millennials, and I'm going to count most people in this room, slash outside, everyone from an e-commerce perspective or a fashion e-commerce perspective, everyone was conversant with it potentially, but through pandemic, they became comfortable with it, right? maybe out of no choice, but whatever, they did become. And I think that's kind of taken a rally behind the whole category itself for us. And the way it kind of played out was earlier, whether it was on Google or whether it was on Mintra, if people were searching for jeans or if they were searching for some kind of specific ethnic, now they have nuanced it to denims to where to work and ethnic to go to parties. Right, so that gives you a sense of comfort for both people who are predominantly potentially offline uh, or some doing online and offline, just the level of comfort increased through the pandemic and therefore from a digital perspective, it became very, very important and for us as a business. The Gen Z, of course, were born there. Uh, so for them, there was no adoption cycle. This w is their world. Uh, so that's kind of how uh, we saw it play out. The juxtaposition of these two are always interesting as a market here. And, you know, so how does Gen Z play out? I'll use the lens of the millennial uh, itself, right? Uh, few vectors where I think the core is common, but how it plays out is very different. So one is from a fashion perspective, if you look at it, there's a lot of social validation that's important. That's important for both, right? A social identity, important for both, but for millennials, it's social identity to fit into a crowd. For Gen Z, it would be a social identity to stand out from within the crowd, right? Uh, so that's kind of how the two are potentially a little different because Gen Z are far more comfortable expressing who they are, what they want to be, uh, and fashion tends to be a sense of that expression. So for us as a category, that works amazingly well. The social identity is also a sense of what social is for each of them, right? For millennials, it's about the long friends list that you would potentially have. Uh, for Gen Z, it's about a much tighter circle that they care about, right? So, and it, therefore, also their other choices play out accordingly. Uh, in the category perspective, it's about saying you would look for linens for summer. Uh, Gen Z would look potentially for nostalgia for college wear this month versus street wear next month versus cottage core the next month. So just this level of specificity. So that's how it kind of changes. So they are making a generalization, but if millennials look for style, Gen Z look for trends, 
right? Broad generalization, I'm just saying it to, you know, kind of stretch the two extremes. So that, was, so that social identity is one piece of how it breaks out. The second is fashion and where people seek inspiration from. Everyone seeks inspiration for fashion. Uh, again, plays out differently. Millennials will look for fashion more from where it is, uh, if I could just say, accepted fashion. Uh, so they would look for celebrities, Bollywood or otherwise. Uh, for Gen Z, they would look for inspiration, but from more what they would term authentic sources, from more exploratory sources. So what would be a Kiara Advani in one place would be a Komal Pandey in the other, right? So that's kind of how it plays out, but both seek inspiration. Gen Z add a little more value to inspiration when they, it's not just about fashion, but it's also about inclusivity, it's about sustainability, all pieces which are important from a fashion perspective also. So again, that's kind of how carves out differently. And the last one, which is important from a business point of view, is value perception. Uh, everyone in India loves value, so that doesn't change. Uh, but wha what they consider for value changes, again, for millennials, it's what do I get out of it? Uh, for Gen Z, of course, that matters. But they will also be ready to put a premium if the experience of getting that is better, is personalized, is different. Uh, so with Gen Z, at least from a fashion perspective, we have a higher share of wallet because it's important for them to express themselves and fashion and things like that. Uh, their wallet size may be a little lower than millennials, uh, but share of wallet is different because of these reasons. So that's kind of how I've, we've seen this play out across the two cohorts, across everything that we've done. Very interesting, Sundar. I think super exciting that you're the first panelist who spoke about it and you were very able to sort of carve out the difference between millennials and Gen Z, uh, a term which very often we see marketers and uh, media professionals get very confused about, uh, which obviously brings me to you, uh, Prashant. Uh, one thing that stood out while Sundar was talking about was fitting in and standing out. Now, you own a category which is you could fit in or stand out. How does this how does the decoding of Gen Z uh, work for you when you're at, uh, you know, planning strategies for reaching out to a certain audience? Because I assume a large part of your audience would also be Gen Z. Happy to hear your thoughts. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So even before we delve into the specifics of targeting and media planning, it's very important to understand the psyche of these two uh, cohort segments, age groups, whatever word you want to use. So firstly, we are talking about millennials who... Uh, in their youth have seen an economy which is booming, who have seen smaller games, mobiles, which did not, which had snake to play with, uh, saw evolution from 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, right, confused generation, all of us. Uh, we have seen technology evolving rapidly and we have seen different devices in our hands. Now what it also says is our entire experience has been very different compared to Gen Z, which is someone who gets the latest device in their hand at 12 years of age. So digital natives, when we talk, it's, it's about the fact that uh, we are still learning technology as we are going ahead. They already know technology. That's one thing. Second thing, if we talk about them versus us, uh, I don't know why it's a versus, it should be more of an and, but the fact is that they are far more socially responsible and aware versus millennials who are now learning these new concepts because at our point of time when we were growing, these concepts were spoken lesser compared to the mass acceptability, awareness, and the fact that there is more evolution of uh, help available to all of them. So that's also a big difference. Innovation, right? I mean, I was reading a stat somewhere that uh, the average span of attention for a millennial is 12 seconds, but for a Gen Z is eight seconds. And it's also because of the fact that we were used to looking at comms or campaigns of a certain duration when we are growing up, and hence we replicate that, versus a Gen Z who has a device at 12 years of age and is way too distracted, which is a good thing, it's not a bad thing, way too distracted and hence able to do multitasking far better than us and able to comprehend, process, and experiment with more things out there versus us who are more skeptical. And lastly, if you talk about innovation itself, uh, a Gen Z is looking for innovations compared to a millennial who's very happy with certain brands and the experience that that brand gives and, and a lot of commonalities between what you said as well that whilst a millennial has more money to spend, the Gen Z is seeking more value 
So, and, and that's the theme for Q1, Q2 as well, where value is now a convergence point for both Gen Z and millennial, and everyone is looking for more bang for their buck. Now coming to the category, and I'll take two more minutes. The fact of the matter is that uh, when we target, and that's the specific question, what we have realized is there are very different platforms on which both these cohorts are existing. The common factor is Instagram. But when I talk about a millennial, you will also find the millennial on a Twitter, or you'll find them on LinkedIn, right? But, but a Gen Z is more, again, eight second time span. So looking at shorter video content, so more of TikToks of the world, more of uh, uh, short video format advertising, right? And Snapchats of the world. So once in, for example, in my category, both of them are very important. Because you recruit them when they are Gen Z, and you hope that in the lifetime they remain with you when they are whatever is the new term that comes when they are in their 30s and 40s. But the fact is that if you do not isolate these platforms and create content accordingly, uh, you would be doing a carpet bombing hoping that it succeeds rather than customizing and catering to the expectations of Gen Z versus millennials. Very interesting. I think, uh, you know, Shant, I like the way how you put across the analogies, but especially for a category like yours. I mean, if you look at the people sitting on this panel, you dress up to go out with the fanciest phone in your pocket and obviously you want to afford that and hence uh, another category. So I think when it does come to Gen Z, obviously he has laid the land for you in his static line that we used to be a generation of uh, snakes and little smartphones and I think most of us didn't even get a smartphone by the time we, I don't know, we were 21 or 18, I don't even know. I don't even remember it was so long back. But if you look at the era today, uh, the men, I mean, these guys are young, these guys want a smartphone, they want the best one and I'm assuming while the purchasing power, I'm not sure you can give more insights, may not lie with them but then again they are very capable of affording a smartphone and it's part of how you look at targeting. So what are your thoughts when it comes to decoding the Gen Z and uh, when it comes to the smartphone industry uh, as an overall ecosystem? So, uh, Is this better? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, you know, from, from um, a smartphone standpoint, one of the things that uh, what we try and do is bring a sense of hyper-focus, right? And so for us, it's less about millennials versus Gen Z. It's, it's really focusing on Gen Z, right? Because one of the truths of consumers is, and it's been consistent for the last, whatever, five, six, seven decades, right? Kids between the age of, say, 17 or 18 till 22 are the, are the consumers who really drive how the larger economy behaves, right? These are the guys who are the tastemakers of society. Uh, and so the way from an OPPO standpoint, the way we look at this is uh, we bring a sense of hyper-focus on, on Gen Z, uh, but we don't really kind of call Gen Z, Gen Z internally. Uh, we have a word for them um, which, which we use, which is true gen. Uh, and true gen, actually the, the, uh, the origin of the word is from the First World War. Uh, there's a very interesting documentary you guys should see. Uh, it's basically about Ernest Hemingway in the First World War. And true gen in its essence basically meant uh, real information during the World War versus gossip, right? And when you think about the true gen in, in the current circumstances, a lot of what Sundar and Prashant spoke about, about this being a generation that's woke, this being a generation that is uh, about I, me, myself, this is a generation that's uh, hyper-cognitive in, in terms of, you know, really getting information from a host of sources. It's not really looking at Doordarshan or, or Star TV and deciding what they want, but they basically get a lot of information from various sources. And so the way you kind of build your marketing then is how do you build a consistent narrative across media platforms, across your, your, your marketing efforts in ensuring that there's a red thread that kind of, you know, uh, really captures what your storyline is across product launches. Um, and so what that's meant from an OPPO standpoint is uh, the interesting part for us obviously has been what's played out in the last few years has really been on smartphones, right? And that gives us a unique opportunity on not only kind of defining how people experience the world around them, but also the, the things that we rally around as a company and as a brand. Uh, and you, there are of course, a, it's a hyper-competitive industry um, and all of us focus on different things uh, and from an OPPO standpoint what we've kind of brought a sharp focus on uh, is can we become the brand of choice for creators, right? And so we bring uh, a sense of clarity on saying our purpose is really to kind of inspire the creators uh, and the way we do that is by having an immensely powerful story around cameras for example, right? Uh, and so the notion of, of being a 
a portrait camera or the notion of creating the best reels you can without needing anything else. Your phone is your office. Uh, this is a generation that literally lives off smartphones. Uh, and so from an OPPO standpoint, what we've done is obviously in the last four or five years, uh, really sharpen our messaging around saying, uh, you know, you're in the world to create memories. Uh, and we as a company are on that journey of not only inspiring you, with the product that we create, but also making that journey of creation simpler, easier, uh, and more meaningful. Um, the other element of, uh, of the true gen, obviously, is the sense of, uh, of caring for the world around them, right? This is like, like Prashan just said, this is not a generation that just talks. They also want this behavior to be kind of mirrored by brands. And that's the kind of brand that they kind of vibe with, the kind of brands that they, they, they um, adopt are brands that understand their values. Uh, and so from that perspective, one of the big shifts that we've made is we're literally creating products that last longer, right? Uh, and of course, it, it has an implication on the upgrade cycle of our smartphones. But what's more important is literally putting out product in the world that lasts longer, uh, that literally allow consumers who are value conscious, of course, to buy products that last longer, but more importantly, also have an environment story. I mean, we're committed to being a carbon neutral company by 2050, but we're not waiting that long, you know, to really give back to, to the planet. Uh, and so when you have like these consistent themes that resonate with the Gen Z, uh, you become a brand that uh, they do not only respect, uh, but also promote more actively. And so for us, that's kind of uh, a chemistry uh, that's really, really important. Very interesting, I think. I mean, then we'll come back on a few of those and double down on that on second question. But before we do that, I mean, how has it been the journey? Uh, you're a company which probably built its thought process around making things accessible, affordable for a certain kind of generation. And I'm quite sure that the whole concept of Gen Z, maybe whether it was defined in that word terminology or not, surely played in a crucial part in your evolution uh, while taking up the role for an entrepreneur. So what's, what's it like for Snapment and uh, what are your thoughts on this? So, uh, hello, yeah. So, uh, unlike all the brands which are quite there for, been there for long, we are quite an nascent brand. So, and limited resources to begin with. So, we had to figure out a small niche to start the brand instead of solving for Gen Z, Millennial and all of that. And so, the focus, uh, we found that in the uh, financial world, the the uh, in terms of the online shopping, the millennial was very well equipped by the installments and affordability options they had, and and the and the Gen Z segment, which was driving a lot of the purchases directly or purchase decisions on the online platform, was very Ill highly equipped in terms of financial financial enablement, like in terms of. Uh, um, 70% of India, even Gen Z, is still with banks like SBI, Bank of Baroda, and Punjab National Bank. And, and when they try to buy things uh, online, they, they don't have that, uh, those options and those, uh, those, uh, uh, that, that enablement in terms of affordability, which, which you and I, we take it for granted that we can buy uh, an Oppo phone on Amazon on EMI. But 90% of India can't buy it on online on EMI, uh, whereas 60% of people buy it online, uh, offline on EMI. So, uh, so we we had to just focus on Gen Z, and that's the segment we worked on. The only flavor we had of millennial was we found that there were some millennials, uh, old 45-year-old aunties buying. Uh, sorry, not saying aunties, but <laughs> but 45-year-old in in the in the in the sense of the person who was purchasing was a person buying a gaming console and his auntie was buying it for him. <laughs> so that was, I said, it's an auntie buying it for a kid. Yeah. And that's why the, uh, that's why the, that, and we found it really tough. Then we saw uh, 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 like 45 year old men buying tank tops. And we found that was very interesting because for a while, yeah, I mean, uncles like me. He just said podcast. tank tops, 45 year old men, tank tops. Did I hear it right? Yes. And then we realized what. Sundar, you have some explanation to do after this, okay? So, yeah. So, so what we went ahead and thought, what's the question there? What's, what's happening there? We, for a while, were not enabling customers above 21 year old to buy on EMI. 
so the women were using their parents identities to buy on EMI same with the guys they were persuading their moms they were persuading their um, aunts and they were persuading their elders in their family to buy on EMI so and 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 what we found interesting that is that a lot of customers were really focused on uh, the, gen, the when we when we went out with the EMI op option, most of people said, "Oh, you are going for mobiles or those kind of categories." But then we realized that the customers are these customers are not buying uh, appliances or other things; they are buying fashion. So, if you look at even brands like Mintra today on their website, you will see EMI as an option on the product page. So, so that's the thing we found about that. Yeah, and sorry for that reference. No, I think it's fine. I think uh, just for everyone, uh, probably in this era we used to call aunt, auntie, but it's fine. Uh, let's not judge. Uh, but tank tops and men, I still have to probably check with Sundar on that insight, man. Um, let's, let's quickly jump to you, Prashant. I think, you know, Burger King is a classic example, one of the classic brands, one of the most creative histories of doing some great uh, work, right? And I think in very recent times, your uh, meme Premier League uh, campaign during the IPL 2022 season garnered significant attention by leveraging the power of the meme culture uh, that resonates deeply with the uh, new age audience. Uh, integrating that with NFT giveaways further cemented its relevance uh, with the target audience. Can you elaborate what thought was behind this creative ideas and how do you guys go about it? Like, so. Uh it's, it's interesting that you're mentioning Meme Premier League, which actually was uh, the third part of the series. Uh, I'll quickly talk about the first two as well. So what we at Burger King keep doing is integrating technology in consumer campaigns along with content, right? So the first one was something that we started talking about COVID, right? Flame Grill 2020, wherein the campaign was very simple. 2020 burned your plants. It's time to flame grill 2020 itself. So we created this AR filter on Instagram wherein you could just point it at anything that reminds you of your failed plans and grill marks would appear on it and I would give you a Whopper for it because Whopper is a flame grilled best burger in town. But uh, after, after that campaign, what we realized was that uh, it, it achieved 10% engagement rate versus a benchmark of two, two and a half. So that gave us confidence that technology could be integrated more and more. And that's where we then attacked IPL, wherein we launched a campaign called The Greatest Hack. Now this campaign, uh, what it did was, whilst you were watching the match, depending upon the match moment, whether it's a wicket, whether it's a, a, a dead over, or whether it's a, it's a run out, or whether it's a four or a six or a 50 or a 100, depending upon the match moment, whilst watching the match, if you were accessing the game that we had designed, basis the match moment, you could get a coupon which you could click, so there was a gamification, and then you could redeem it on the BK app itself. Now, all this is happening real time. And the way we designed this entire thing was, even if you attend that session on a game for 12 balls or lesser, there would be minimally four different unique coupons that you could get on different layers of the menu, which you could then uh, validate and use on the BK app itself. Now, that got us 50,000 gameplays uh, over a span of IPL with some 30,000 unique users. So the average times people came to play this was almost 1.3, 1.5. So that again gave us a lot of confidence. And that's when we then launched Meme Premier League, which was the next IPL, 2022, wherein what we realized was the, the language of Gen Z and to a certain extent now millennials as well is memes. I mean, that's what people are talking about, forwarding. And that's where we launched Meme Premier League, a 60-day campaign, a nightmare for me and my team, wherein every single match was immortalized by a meme. And then uh, the meme pages were partnered with as well. They were creating memes. My audiences were creating memes. And we got an engagement of 35%. Uh, 152 million reach. And that's, that's the kind of numbers. Quite a bonkers campaign, very hard work. But what we also decided there was metaverse was a conversation nfts was a conversation and we realized that what if we start creating these memes generated by users immortalizing them as a nft and giving them in their crypto wallet and all this was done again by having weekly leaderboards and people posting it and more people liking it so it was all community based however what we realized was that whilst we marketers were very excited about metaverse and nfts uh, the audiences were not as excited so whilst we were the first in the industry to do an NFT. It, it's not something that people wanted or understood at that point of time because it required a crypto wallet and it required a certain technological sense and know-how. And 
so a lot of people actually said, don't give me an NFT. Give me rather a free WAP or something, which any issue they were getting. So that also was a learning that whilst we may believe that certain tech conversations could be the talk of the town at that point of time, maybe the audiences have not really reached a critical mass wherein they are as popular and a part of their life journeys as well. So whilst the campaign did wonderfully well for the brand, the NFT part of it was something that could have uh, waited till that conversation matured in the industry. But at the same time, when I did something known as the Sober Whopper, and when I say I am talking about Burger King, right? The Sober Whopper was basically, we know you're going to party hard, right? And Jan 1st is going to be a day of drowsiness. So here is a carb-loaded, cheese-loaded Whopper so that you can cure your hangover, right? And that itself was a conversation which was very close to the audiences, especially Gen Z, wherein one inside of Gen Z is they want brands to be loyal to them rather than the other way around. So if you design content and comms which mirror their life, right, without judgment, uh, it tends to do far better and it tends to position your brand better and they stick to your brand. And a sober whopper would probably be a far more of a conversation which went viral than an NFT, right? So, so again, learnings from these uh, Gen Z uh, audiences. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's the reality of the world out there. Great, I think standing out versus fitting in, right? This is one thing that I took away from Sundar and I think anything that you said about this particular campaign was uh, making it relevant uh, to where it should be. So, uh, Sundar, I mean, uh, iconic advertising campaigns, you've probably got everyone on the roster from Shah Rukh Khan to the who's who. Um, but I'm going to talk about something specific, right? I think you've consistently stayed ahead of the curve, exemplified by the recent uh, hashtag Mintra FWD. Uh, launch, uh, tailored to diverse requirements of fashion forward Gen Z population across the nation. Um, take us through that framework and the underpinned launch of Mintra FWD. People would love to know more. Sure, sure. Uh, first things, the Gen Z call it forward, not FWD. <laughs> um. No, uh, so I'll tell you where for us being in fashion, I think Mintra has always been on the forefront of anything related to style and trends, fashion related. Uh, but I think over the years what we've noticed from a user behavior on the app and what people are searching for, you got a clear sense that there was more than what we only had, right? Uh, so about probably a year back, we started this range of, you can use different terms for it, you can call it quick fashion, you can call it edgy fashion, any of those things under the name called Stylecast, which was on the app. For us to almost understand what this opportunity is, we did not understand the audience. Uh, we, yeah, and we wanted to test it out. Luckily, being digital first allowed us that. So over the year, we got a better sense of which audiences, what did they look for, what were they browsing, what were they searching, what were they clicking, and what were they buying. And that, when you couple it with social listening, when you couple it with traditional research, gave us a much better flavor and understanding of what Gen Z was looking for. Uh, and we kind of took all those pieces in and launched it as forward. One big piece of understanding this cohort is they are interested in their own world. So for us, when Stylecast was across the app, uh, forward has a place of its own, it's almost if I could loosely call it an app in an app. So when someone gets in there, it's that world. So for Gen Z, that is the world that they can look at. And you obviously went back to building the right, the core brand promise, which is what's the selection that we're going to offer you from a fashion perspective, from a pricing perspective, value perspective, et cetera. Uh, and where we skewed it and where it's different is, again, if you go through the forward app, two things that stand out versus the rest of the app is one is it's trend first. Uh, so as you scroll through, you will see everything from the listings being as per Barbie core, cottage core, streetwear, so on and so forth. Second, lot more visual and video led uh, as opposed to lots of tiles. So because again, how Gen Z look at it. So we kind of got those flavors in as a base. The second part of forward, which was most interesting for me is because they look for experience and the experience of purchase as important as what they purchase were the tech capabilities that went behind it. 
because they look for trends, and that is their mantra, we said, trends are your inspiration. We will enable you to buy them. Where do they look for inspiration for trends? They will look anywhere on social media. They will look at it anywhere on the road, in their colleges, wherever. So uh, the tech integration there is what we call spot it, get it. So if you see someone wearing something cool on Insta, you kind of take a screenshot of that. You send it to Mintra through Insta. It will automatically show you that same thing that's available on Mintra and you can buy it. Right? So that's the kind of seamlessness of spotting it and buying it uh, and kind of closing that loop on trend for them. Not just that we have trends or learn about trends, but how do you go through uh, the whole process. Uh, the next one was search and again how they search and Gen Z is are far more nuanced and they know things much more than the average consumer. They research things uh, and they are much more aware. So again, they would not only be searching specific terms or words, but in everything that we are seeing from a generational conversational AI perspective, uh, they will not search for wedding dress. They will search for, I have a wedding in Chennai, I like pink, what can I wear, right? And so we, we've kind of gotten a fashion GPT embedded into Mintra for exactly these kind of questions and the adoption that we've seen on that has been really, really cool. So that becomes a part of how do you, you know, as Prashant Love called it beautifully, how do you stay loyal to them? Uh, and th th this is the universe that we kind of built around that. And then the, to top it off, which was, you know, how do you talk to them and tell them about it is the marketing campaign itself, where we didn't go with the names that you spoke about, for example, but what we've just launched the campaign with is Vedang uh, and Kushi, who are again, not no movie of theirs is out yet or anything going to come out, but these are the people who from a social media perspective have the courage to talk about it. So that's kind of how we've seen the world of Gen Z and uh, how we've kind of gone into it. Learn and build more on it, of course, but that's, yeah, that's, that's been what forward is. Superb, Sutra. I think that's a marketing class 101 of how to look at integrating not just the output part of it, which is the visual aspect of advertising, but actually in work, working on the experience itself. I've been on the Mintra Forward app and I would recommend anyone who's not gone there to look out for the experience that that app offers in terms of shopping. And I think it'll be, it'll be really exciting for you uh, as well. So uh, kudos for sharing that in that much detail. Um, I know the, the board shows us time up, but I'm quite sure we didn't spend an hour. I think it's, it's less than 30 minutes, but uh, quickly, Damiant, I think uh, we talked about, you were discussing certain uh, things that you guys have done in the past, right? Yeah. I mean, for nearly a decade, Oppo has skillfully taken Indian cell phone market by a storm. Spot on advertising, spot on marketing, you're everywhere that you need to be, you know, across platforms. Could you shed some light on the key factors which contribute to your brand's ability to consistently strike the chord with your target audience. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, Oppo has been in India for about nine years. Um, and the, the journey has kind of evolved from in the early days using a very, very heavy hammer of pure media spends to being, you know, a little bit more nuanced in the way we're doing marketing now. Uh, so obviously, I mean, it's been a journey where, you know, we've taken a very straightforward, straight-jacketed, traditional media approach of sponsoring the Indian cricket team, literally painting India green with out of home boards, etc., to now being a lot more nuanced in the way we kind of, uh, you know, tell our story. Uh, for me, I think the, the, and I'll keep it short, I think for us, the real learning in the last few years has been uh, the young kids are not looking for, they actually actively reject advertising. They're not interested, they're card cutters, they're not interested in listening to brand stories. And so what's really important for us as marketers is to understand how we can tell a seamless story using things that they relate to better. And that in today's world is influencers, obviously. Uh, and influencers literally represent uh, a media platform of their own. Uh, and what we've done fairly aggressively in the last 12 to 14 months is we've not only built an in-house team that's purely working on creating content for Instagram, for example. It's a six-member team that's purely looking at creating content for Instagram, using influencers, telling brand stories. That's one part of it. But also when we are creating more traditional marketing, we are shooting vertical video first. 
right? So that's the way we're briefing our agency partners. The, the other element is even when we're using influencers, we're trying to keep the brand narrative seamless, being true to what the influencers actually say on their digital platforms day to day versus saying, today because you're doing an OPPO ad, your content should look different. You know, the moment we start behaving like that is when uh, consumers start rejecting our content. So I think for us, the journey really has been how to be less brandy in the content that we're making and being more accepting and being a little bit more inclusive and letting the creativity of the influencers dictate how our marketing storytelling happens. So that's… Uh, oh, superb. Thank you, Ramanth, and thanks for keeping it short and brief as well. Uh, Prashant uh, had a hard stop at 1.15, uh, but uh, if, you, if you allow me five minutes, we'll wrap it up in five minutes, yeah? Superb, thank you, thank you. So, Abhinit, yeah. one quick question for you. Badi Kushia Choti EMI, what was the thought process behind this and was there a specific, uh, you know, acumen which went into targeting it to a certain kind of audience? No, I, I think uh, there was, uh, yeah, uh, it's the concept revolves around EMI. EMI as a concept is not something that is new. It has there, been for there forever, but the, the where it, it made uh, sense for us was uh, that at a Gen Z level, they, the customer was not amenable, they didn't have Sybil score, so we had to, what we had to go after is what are the small, the categories they are interested like fashion and gadgets, and how do we enable it with the kind of information we can learn about Gen Z. So they don't have a uh, credit score or something. What we look at is what is their social profile like. Uh, a customer may not have a, uh, a big credit score, but they may have a GitHub profile. Based on that, we can say, oh, you know, this customer is really something whom we can take take a punt on. And, and it's all about that, that uh, allowing customers to, to make uh, purchases on EMIs, that's, it's a, not a very subtle thing, the EMIs. No, perfect. Um, I didn't want to rush you up, but the way it is. But thank you guys for this super panel. And uh, before we wrap it up, I'm going to uh, put something across to you guys, which I didn't tell you about, which is obviously out of the syllabus, because that's the whole purpose of doing it. Uh, I'm known for doing it, but I will not do it as good as the man who does it called Karan Johar. So it's a rapid fire round. The rules are very simple. I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to answer it in the immediate go without thinking too much about it. Uh, I don't want to put you on a spot, but that's the whole purpose of putting you in a spot. So I'm going to start with you, Sundar. Okay. Um, if you got a chance to make one of these two Mintra ambassadors for a day, who would you choose? The vibrant Barbie or the vintage classic Oppenheimer? Oh, Barbie. Okay. Prashant? Forget the cage fight. If these two were to enter a burger eating cont contest, who would win? Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg? Elon Musk for everything because he's an alien. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Damiant, where are you watching the Asia Cup? On your mobile, connected TV or the linear broadcast? Connected TV actually, yeah. Connected TV actually. Superb. Last to you, I mean, which one, of, according to you, is the most predictable downward trend? Chat GPT or Metaverse? Downward trend? Yeah. Uh, I would say Metaverse, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's all from us, guys. Thank you so much and uh, hope you had a good panel.